We've got the four greatest sports cameras in the world. Let's, Let's see, see which, which is, the is best. best. This one's not. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Goodbye, Justin. Justin. Try not to kick it too far. Whew, how did it go? The Canon 1DX Mark II was way better. I mean, they're, they're all fine, but this one did 16 frames a second. Um, both these cameras have high speed modes where you lock the mirror up. You can't see through the viewfinder anymore. Yeah. They shoot faster. This one shoots at 14 frames a second, this one does 16. But with the Nikon at 14 frames a second, not only is it slower, but it takes a really long time to show you the images on the, the screen on the back. The Canon, you see them almost in real time. So you can actually follow the ball and move things around. It also focused in live view way, way faster. So as far as still subjects, high frame rate, Canon wins. For now. Let's see how well each camera can track some action. Both cameras did a great job tracking a moving subject, getting basically 100% of the shots in focus and good light. However, the Canon has a slightly faster frame rate, so it gets a few extra pictures in focus. The Nikon, however, has 3D tracking that follows the subject as it moves around the frame. In the real world, shooting soccer, we found using 3D tracking much more effective than manually changing focusing points. So we give the Nikon D5 a slight edge. Fast frame rates really do get you better shots. For flying birds, there's always one shot with a better wing position. When you spend months waiting for the right animal to show up and do something interesting and for the light to be perfect so you can get that one shot for your portfolio or wall, you want the gear to give you the best possible result. It's awesome at tracking flying birds and 14 frames a second is really useful for getting the perfect wing position, but it is so loud that like even flying birds will be disturbed by it. And it does have the quiet mode, which seems to slow th things down some, but uh, that's not very quiet either. I don't think it's really louder than any other camera. It's just with that really high frame rate, it seems much louder. When tracking flying birds in typical light, the 1DX Mark II, the D5, the D500, and even the 7D Mark II get close to 100%. We really can't even use focusing to differentiate between the cameras. In our more controlled low light stress test, the 1DX Mark II got very slightly more shots in focus than the D5, followed by the D500 with the 7D Mark II coming in last. But is 20 megapixels on a full frame camera good enough? If you can get close enough, yes. But I got about as close as you can possibly expect to get to a flying osprey without disturbing it. Using a full 700 millimeters and filling the frame with the bird required a 3x crop. That means the resulting picture is about 2.5 megapixels from the 1DX Mark II. And because of the AA filter, there's even less detail than you'd expect. 
and that was good enough for Instagram, but it's not good enough to sell as a print or for stock. If I'd gotten the shot with the D500 or the 5DSR, those pictures would have been much more printable and sellable. Comparing this real-world owl photo, the 50 megapixel 5DSR is noticeably sharper than the 20 megapixel 1DX Mark II. Of course, because megapixels matter. And even handheld, even without hard light, even without a teleconverter, you can see the difference. And yes, they're both in focus. Trust me, I double and triple check this for every comparison test that we shoot. Okay, so which camera should you get for wildlife? Well, the Nikon D5 has an awesome focusing system and 12 frames a second when you're using the viewfinder. But the 1DX here, has 14 frames a second, and you should not get either one of them. Why? Because they both have a very low pixel density, 20 megapixels full frame, which means once you crop, you get down to very, very small numbers of megapixels. Like with a good crop, you might end up with only three megapixels. They both also have heavy anti-aliasing filters. Those anti-aliasing filters do things like reduce the moiré that you can see on my shirt here. But for wildlife, that's really not a problem. We've never had a problem with that. So for flying birds, I would instead recommend the Nikon D500. 10 frames a second, still very fast. Same amazing focusing system from the D5. No anti-aliasing filter. And those 20 megapixels are crammed into a 1.5x crop. And for flying birds, there's almost no chance of you filling the frame. Yes, the full frame viewfinder is really nice, but you'll get better, sharper results with this, I promise. Another alternative is the Canon 5DSR, which has a remarkable 50 megapixels on a full frame body with no anti-aliasing filters. And that's kind of my go-to camera. It's only like five frames a second, so it's not producing nearly as many shots of flying birds but the shots that you get are remarkably sharp, as sharp as the D500s, whether or not you need the crop. So you can go ahead and fill the frame with it and you'll get sharper pictures than you will with any other current camera. For things like deer or perched birds, the 5DSR is my go-to camera. If I don't need to capture action, there's no question, the 5DSR produces vastly, vastly better results than either the D5 or the 1DX Mark II, and it's way cheaper. In fact, you could buy yourself a Canon 7D Mark II and a 5DSR or a D500 and a 5DSR and still spend less money than on one of these bodies. And I promise you'll be getting better results. So why do so many of the most experienced wildlife pros in the world shoot with one of these bodies or one of the earlier generations? Because of this. This is the Canon EOS 1V and it's a film camera. Back in the film days, look at this. This is where you put the film. Film, it's like your memory cartridge, right? <laughs> Back in the film days, you didn't have to worry about things like anti-aliasing filters or megapixels because every camera had the same 35 millimeter full frame sensor. So you could get this top end body with its super fast frame rate and awesome focusing system and not make any compromises. But today, the sensor and the body are coupled. And unfortunately, Canon and Nikon don't give you choices about that. So they put in these sensors that are, you know, good for fast action and good for low light, but not good for detail. And myself as a wildlife photographer, I'm always striving for more sharpness. The biggest challenge is getting close to the birds. So yes, you can get great pictures with these. You'll see lots of the best wildlife photographers in the world getting great pictures with these, but it's not because they chose the right camera body it's because they're the best wildlife photographers in the world because they have been shooting from the film era. And I get their choice because once you shoot with a full body like this, it's really tough to go down to one of the smaller bodies. They don't feel as good. They're not as well weatherproofed. But if you're about the results, you'll take my recommendation and get yourself a 5DSR or a D500. With a high contrast subject, both cameras managed to successfully focus at EV minus one, which is really dark. But they both failed at EV minus two, which is even darker. That's equivalent to F2.8, 1 30th, and ISO 200,000. So it's, it's really, really dark. But that doesn't match the manufacturer's quoted ratings of focusing at EV minus three. But they were both significantly better than any other camera we've tested. Basically, they're the same, and you can't go wrong with either camera. But the Nikon D5 and D500 do have light up buttons, which can save your ass in dark environments when your fingers haven't yet memorized the button placement.
In addition to our objective, analytical, unbiased comparison testing, we spend as much time as possible shooting in the real world with all the cameras we review, but we don't bring a camera crew with us. So I went and shot a car show, and the 1DX Mark II worked fine. Though, really, I wish I would have had a camera that had a tilt screen to assist me with low shots, or a, just a smaller camera that would make it easier to hand hold while reaching my arms out into engine bays. Basically, I wouldn't have picked one of these expensive cameras. I would have grabbed like an ADD or a D750. Image quality. We made a whole separate video pixel peeping every aspect of the images created by these. So check that out if you want all the details. But a quick summary. The image quality differences between the D5 and the 1DX Mark II are indistinguishable in the vast majority of real world situations. In other words, you probably will never notice any kind of difference, but if you're getting really nitpicky, the 1DX Mark II does show better dynamic range than the D5 if you wanna just really, really recover shadows at the base ISO. And uh, the D5 we found has less noise at higher ISOs than the 1DX Mark II is. So you'd pick the one, the D5, the Nikon, if you're shooting in extremely, extremely low light conditions, like north of ISO 25,600, which is, is pretty rare. But maybe in like a dark club, I might pick the D5 instead. However, the Canon 5DSR here is far cheaper than either camera and produces vastly better images with vastly more detail and while the dynamic range and the noise don't don't quite match either of these bodies, you can easily trade that extra detail by for, for cleaner images by cranking up the noise reduction a little bit. And you still end up with overall better images with just a little bit, a single slider of post-processing. For all the details, check out our full video. As video cameras, they both support 4K and the images look absolutely beautiful. But we don't recommend either one of them as video cameras. If you want to compare, the 1DX Mark II is a much better video camera than the D5. Live view works much better, live view focusing works much better, and it supports 4K and 60 frames a second. It also doesn't have the three minute recording limitation that the D5 currently have and has. And yes, Nikon, there's been rumors that they're gonna release a new firmware update, but I talked to the Nikon guys and they won't confirm anything and there's not anything out now. I don't want you spending 6,500 bucks hoping they're gonna extend that and they won't. The D5 does have one big advantage over the 1DX Mark II in that you can record 4K out to an HDMI field recorder that overcomes the three minute limit. If you hook up this up to an HDMI recorder, you only get 1080p for some reason we can't fathom. Nonetheless, they're not great video cameras because, well, they lack an electronic viewfinder. They lack things like the Sony S-Log. This Canon does not have the Canon C-Log, which is great for capturing extra dynamic range in video. If you don't know what that means, you probably don't care. And they also lack tilting screens, which we find to be just critical for use for DSLR style video. For the complete details of our video and lots of sample footage at different ISOs, watch our comparison of the video quality on YouTube. Physically, these cameras are like eerily similar. <laughs> From two different competing companies, you would think these cameras were made by the same manufacturer. Like, it's, it's freaky. The dimensions are almost identical. They both have 1980s LCDs down here and 1980s LCDs up here in almost precisely the same shape. And, and look at the way the, the memory card slots open up for each of them. Like, look, they, they look almost identical. And both the battery packs right here at the side, you pull this out and pull it, you pull this out and pull it. Even the battery chargers are almost identical. <laughs> like, what is going on? How can two competing manufacturers make almost exactly the same camera? Well, it's just that they've been like, going back and forth competing with each other for like decades, like near on a hundred years now. And, and this is kind of the result of that is one, if one makes some minor improvement, the other one makes it and they're both appealing to the same types of, of pro photographers who get very stuck in their ways and don't want to make big changes and just kind of like things to be the same way that they are. So as a result, we don't see anything revolutionary and, and we see it, it's difficult to differentiate functionally. I like the Nikon better. I like the thumb dial on the back. I find that really easy to reach. I find it easier to reach than the secondary dial on the Canon. But the Nikon has one big functional improvement and that's like a, a more functional touchscreen. So I can hit play here and zoom in with my fingers and then just tap through 
or swipe through the different pictures. And that's just, it's just terribly useful for making sure that you have met critical focus on all parts of the frame. The Canon, weirdly, it has a touchscreen and it lets you do some things, but it won't let you do that. You can't interact with it. You can kind of touch to focus, but it's not very intuitive. So it's really weird that they put a touchscreen in the Canon, but then gave it almost no usefulness. Like maybe there'll be a firmware update, but then again, Canon and Nikon, they don't tend to release firmware updates that have big functional improvements like that, which usually if you're hoping for a fix in firmware, it's not gonna come. Oh, and let's do one more comparison against my Samsung S7, a camera that costs like six or 700 bucks, a phone, of course. L look at the way, the brightness of the screens. This is with this screen on full bright and this screen on full bright. You can see the Nikon's a little bit brighter. Look, I, I can touch the focus here and I can touch the focus here, but I can't zoom in. But look at the way the Samsung works. I can just pan in and move around and it's just so much vastly superior. Look how much brighter and prettier the screen is on this little smartphone. We have this huge back. Why do they use so little of it for the screen? And why don't they start integrating like better OLED displays and nicer touchscreens? It's just, it's a terrible screen for such an expensive camera. Let's wrap this up. Should you get the D5 or the 1DX Mark II? It's, there's not much difference. It's, it's like Luke and Owen Wilson. Like they're not the same, but they're kind of the same, right? Like if they put one instead of the other in a movie, you'd probably be okay with that. And, and that's kind of the way it works too. If you're a professional photojournalist or you work for ESPN or something, your boss will probably put one of these cameras in your hands and you're going to be happy with either because like it's, you just you just don't don't notice a difference in the vast majority of situations. The Canon is a little bit faster, and the live view works way better. The Nikon has this awesome 3D focusing that saves your thumb from having to move, move the focusing points around in some situations, and the touchscreen works better. And if one of those is like a killer feature that you must have, then the choice is made for you. Uh, otherwise, if you really are picking between these, maybe you have an investment in either Canon or Nikon lenses, just, just get the body that matches those and don't worry about selling all your lenses, it's probably not worth it. If you haven't invested yet and you're just like a rich guy who's buying his first cameras, uh, you know what, pick a lens that you want to use first and then match the body up to that. And if you don't know much about the lenses, well, frankly, the Canon and Nikon lenses are, are almost identical also because when one makes a 200 to 400, the other one makes it too. But in general, I give the slight edge to the Canon because we tend to like the Canon glass better when we've paired them up against each other for their equivalents. So hope you found this video useful. I'd appreciate it if you gave me a like. Subscribe to see more free videos, including reviews, photography tutorials, Photoshop tutorials, and videography tutorials, and share it with your friends. Any questions, any follow-up questions, just ask a comment. Thanks so much. Bye.